So allow me to start. Uh, this is uh, um, very nice to see many of you back here. Uh, and uh, we are going to continue with the discussion of the theme of creativity. But in this session, we have uh, two papers uh, dealing with education. And it is my pleasure to introduce you to uh, John Mark Reynolds, who is the president of the St. Constantine School in Houston, USA. Dr. Reynolds is a senior fellow of humanities at the King's College, New York, and a fellow of the Center for Science and Culture at the, at the Discovery Institute. He is the founder and director of Tory Honors Institute, the Socratic Great Book Centered Honors Program at Biola University. Dr. Reynolds is the author of numerous books, including When Athens Met Jerusalem, an introduction to classical and Christian thought, and is the editor of the Great Books Reader. He's a frequent blogger and lecturer on a wide range of topics, including ancient philosophy, classical and home education, politics, faith, and virtue. John Mark attends St. Paul Orthodox Church in Katy, Texas, with his parents, brother, wife, who is also here with us, Hope, um, and children. So the floor is yours. I will go back. My talk has gone too quickly. Okay. We, you can close. That's excellent. Thank you. If we can move this. Technology is a wonderful thing when it works. This is what I get for reading my paper from an iPad. Let's see if we can balance it there. My responsibility over the last 30 years, and let me uh, first greet his eminence and the reverend fathers and ladies and gentlemen, thank you. And I pity the translators. They have to move from English to Texan, which is only kind of English. So pardon my accent. My responsibility over the last 30 years has to be, been to build several academic programs an honors college, an apologetics program, a film school, and finally an orthodox school and college in Houston, Texas, that can be the mother of many similar programs. These are reflections in this paper of how one can cooperate with the work of the Holy Spirit and make saints for paradise. Hopefully this provisional look at the roots of education as we thought about them when we started St. Constantine, historically, philosophically, and in practice, will spur others to better thoughts, good questions, and greater works. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. When I began to think about education and being a professor, I began with a particular image that stuck in my head. The Oracle of Delphi commanded, know thyself. But this meant merely to consider our smallness next to the great god, Apollo, and our ignorance compared to the wisdom of the oracle. Socrates transformed this aphorism, know thyself, not to the self-help of the intellectually shallow guru of self-esteem, the person who writes those self-help books, but to a command to dialectic. The dialectic is the process of questioning everything and moving tentatively from one provisional answer to another until seeing what Plato called the known unknown. Education must contain the dialectic, or the process will degenerate into the repetition of socially received or politically approved platitudes. Even truths can become an intellectual trap if these truths do not generate new questions, wonder, or resist all change. The truth must never be forced into an ideology, an intellectual system so comprehensive that all questions are answered 
and all learning from outside is precluded. Socrates himself built on ideas from the pre-Socratics like Heraclitus while looking for the beginning. The beginning is the unified pattern that undergirds the world. Heraclitus found a divine logos, reason or word. This philosopher resisted the idols of his age because they were merely reflections of men, people, in all our fallibility. Man fails when he tries making gods in his image. Instead, Heraclitus looked to a divine that was nothing like us, someone adequate to be a ground of the cosmos. Socrates, or at least Plato's Socrates, left us the dialectic. But his student Plato gave us a worldview, Platonism. This was not an ideology because Platonism has learned from critics and spawned several competing versions. Instead, this school of thought was an excellent preparation for the revelation of God to man in the person of Jesus Christ. In Book 7 of Republic, Plato begins a discussion of education where humanity, trapped in a cave of ignorance and delusion, might be set free by the power of dialectic to see the truth. Once one sees the true light, then the no flickering fire built by our puppet masters, people who try to control us through false education, and ideologues can satisfy. The trouble for Plato was that he had no means to deliver the first person from the cave. He cheats and skips that step. We had to save ourselves educationally, but there was no mechanism to do so. And then Christmas came. And then Christmas came. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we could behold his glory full of grace and truth. Nobody, not even Heraclitus or Plato, anticipated that the divine logos, the mind that created the logic that undergirds the world, would become a man. When Paul came to Athens, as recorded in Acts 17, he answered many religious and philosophical questions when he introduced the God-man, Jesus, dead yet risen. Plato, in Republic 10, had given us the myth of Ur, the man who died and came back from the dead to report that there is a cosmic justice. In the very last lines of Republic, Paul gave the Neoplatonist of Athens a better story. Myth made history. The implications for education should be obvious. The word revealed grace and truth. As an aside, if you get a teacher that is not both graceful and truthful, get a new teacher. We need both. The growth of the soul in a child or adult was not one thing, grace or truth, but both aspects. The dialectic was not lost. Athens and Jerusalem were in dialogue. The eagle has two heads. Athens gave the gift of the dialectic and many ideas. Jerusalem gave the revelation of the God-man. How to understand this? The image of the eastern double-headed eagle is a beautiful window to this truth. This Christian ideal can see Athens and Jerusalem eternally united in one body. Education keeps grace and truth in tension, but without total separation. The two heads on one body dialogue with each other, one urging grace, the other truth. The dialectic and truth, orthodoxy, dialogue, but with essential unity. Education cannot be reduced to Athens or to Jerusalem, grace alone or truth alone, reason or revelation. The attempt to remove this tension is, as we shall see, to leave true education and move to some sterile, dead ideology. For this reason, I believe orthodoxy created a holistic education, and only orthodoxy can sustain it, and only orthodoxy has the deep story of education that can save us from ideologically driven reductionism, turning everything into one thing. It's always the temptation, right? Overly simple answers. School can teach vocation and virtue because our greatest vocation is to be virtuous and our virtue commands us to provide for our own. 
we could look more closely at this slide, but in the interest of time, I just want to say this. Uh, this is a historically relevant thing. Secular education has a nearly continuous history in the Eastern Roman Empire and Byzantine Commonwealth. The theological education was less a product of the theological schools and more in the monastic communities. And this uh, tradition continued to the point that by 425, we can speak of, somewhat anachronistically for the term, the University of Constantinople. There's much that could be said about this, uh, and much that I have said about this that my poor translator had to deal with. Uh, but uh, let's note that an Eastern Roman education is not dissimilar to the education that many Western countries and many Eastern Christian countries have to this day. It was nearly universal at an elementary level. Christians ask this question, who should be educated? The liturgical life of the church is an education of every aspect of a human person. The deep work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer is the subject of profound theological reflection available to, available to all. Without attempting to describe this experience, the scope of the work of the church available to whosoever will suggests that classical Christian education should also be universal. Surely if all can be baptized, all should receive as needed the gifts of an education. The church makes saints for paradise, but the commonwealth also has a role to play in this task. The community in a city, a village, or the countryside does not merely minister to the physical, but educates and trains the Christian in virtue. The faith works out salvation in the hospital, the school, in the fields, especially in the family. A caution is in order. In the United States, many great religious schools, colleges, and universities have been built only to lose their Christian nature. They cease to look for what is good, true, and beautiful in other traditions, but are overwhelmed and separated from Christian truth altogether. That the church does not control the school traditionally, and if we went back and looked at the historical section, you can see that the church did not control the school, but cooperated with the school does not mean that theological truth can be ignored. John Henry Newman, in particular, saw this process in the past. Here's John Henry Newman on education. It is the fashion just now, as you very well know, to erect so-called universities without making any provision in them at all for theological chairs. Institutions of this kind exist both here and in England. Here was Ireland. Such a procedure, though defended by writers of the generation just passed with much plausible argument and not a little wit, seems to me an intellectual absurdity. And my reason for saying so runs, with whatever abruptness, into a form of a syllogism. A university, I should lay down, by its very name, professes to teach universal knowledge. Theology is surely a branch of knowledge, how then is it possible for it to profess all branches of knowledge and yet to exclude from the subjects of its teaching one which, to say the least, is as important and as large as any of them, theology? I do not see that either premise of this argument is open to exception. What we are saying then is that this education that includes all truth must be part of the life of every person. The family is one of the first educators. The father and mother give the first lessons in virtue and truth. They should, as much as they can, choose education that begins in virtue. As St. John, John Chrysostom says to fathers, hear what Paul saith, bring them up in the chastening and admonition of the Lord. Study not to make him an orator, but train him up to be a philosopher. In the want of the one, there will be no harm whatsoever. In the absence of the other, philosophy, all the rhetoric in this world will be of no advantage. Tempers are wanted, not talking. Character, not cleverness. Deeds, not words. These gain a man the kingdom. These confer what are benefits indeed. Wet not his tongue, but cleanse his soul. 
I do not say this to prevent your teaching him these things, but to prevent your attending to them exclusively. Goodness and truth are the standards for what is included, not the source. Education cannot ignore truth just because it is theological and not scientific or due to a pagan or Christian source. The universal education found in the church and outside the church and the family makes Christianity always a school building movement. In the Eastern Roman Empire, education was widespread for men with some access for women. Elementary education was as universal as possible with a focus on writing and reading. Secondary education was available in the classical languages and literature. In Constantinople, there were advanced universities that focused on philosophy and law. Trades such as medicine were learned through apprenticeships. One historic problem was the inconsistency of opportunity in education. The liturgical feast is available to all. The emperor eats the same bread and drinks the same cup as the simplest subject. Too often education outside the church has not been universally available. Irrelevant barriers to education, such as poverty, should have been overcome more often than they were. What we do not yet live in paradise, we can, while we do not yet live in paradise, we can strive to give everyone the education that fits the individual. The true light appears to all who would see. We must strive to make access to school as open as possible to everyone in the church or family. This is one reason we place the St. Constantine School inside the city of Houston in one of the most difficult neighborhoods. And we turn away no one for inability to pay and have made college affordable for everyone who wants to attend fully accredited college. The church, of course, preserves education in down periods when the state cannot do so. There's a practical reason that an educator might wish to build his or her school in a relationship with the church. Doing so is the best way to guard the deposit of knowledge for the future. A healthy society contains both a sound church, loving families, just government, and flourishing social structures, including schools. Eastern Roman history presents a norm of an educational system supported by the government patrons and the family. The church tended to the formation of clergy, though not in a seminary or higher education system. The monasteries and churches, with the help of spiritual elders, provided the formation needed. A society with multiple sources of authority will be safer from tyranny. If allowed independence, a good patriarch can check a bad emperor. A good teacher can illuminate bad teachings, even from a priest. A virtuous parent can protect children from a patron gone wrong. As the history of the Eastern Roman Empire demonstrates, sometimes the government will fall into decay. Wealth plummets, and families have hardly the means to survive. When Eastern Christians became a politically powerless minority, often the church was the only way that Christians were allowed to organize. In other situations, only the church had the resources and facilities to keep any educational program going. The church did fill such gaps, but this was not the norm. Secular authorities could pick up the task again in cases where political power was restored or prosperity returned to families. The church, uniquely out of all the normal structures in society, can fulfill the educational mission. Liturgical worship reveals to us the triune God, including the Son, the divine word of God. The word of God himself points to the importance of both the spoken and written word. Wherever the Christian church has gone, relatively widespread literacy has followed. The reading of sacred scripture in the, light, in the liturgical life of the church necessitates at least some literacy. The church produced many books, and the copying and preservation of all teachings, sermons, and liturgical instructions also encouraged forming a literate public. These documents were generally in the language of the people in the East, and so the church often spurred the creation of a national language and literature. Quite a few people have been able to read and write, have to be able to read and write, for the traditions of the church to continue. The church can save much in culture in hard times because she's very durable due to her mission. Tyrants often failed to destroy the church in the past. This durability is gained whether her mission is sacred, God-protected, 
or if you're a secular thinker, merely deepful, deeply helpful in answering eternal questions. If our mission is sacred, as I believe it is, then God has promised that she, the bride of Christ, will endure to the end of time. However, even if she happened to be mistaken, the mistake is so intellectually interesting, the culture produced so beautiful, and the virtues she commands cultivated that her teachings and liturgy and training endure. Bet on the church if you want to see a society endure. This suggests a practical reason that the educator should not separate himself from the church entirely. Tyrants are terrible periods in human history will come. And in these times, education or even human knowledge will face perils. The church has shown herself to be resilient and able to save much, educate many, even in the most difficult times. Close association with the church is both prudent and practical. And so in the East, we don't have the parish school controlled by the church, but we don't have the secular school as we see in the West with no association with the church, failing to teach all knowledge, theological knowledge. Instead, we have the secular school that includes the wisdom of theology, working with the church and the church serving by necessity as an eternal fallback position, a place where education can endure. There is a tension inside of classical Christian education that we must recognize. And this tension is both why our schools can do so much good and why we might fail the ancient question, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem, exposes the problem. Wisdom found within the church, or that easily agrees with the received truths of the church, does not always harmonize quickly with wisdom found outside the church. One solution would have been to reject the pagans, wisdom outside the church, the non-Christians altogether, but that was never the mainstream Christian way. The schools Christians founded read the pagans, but they were also Christians. Error was not so difficult when obvious. Yet when the ideas in pagan literature were obviously wrong, a student could be shown the error and prepared to refute it. But what if something seemingly good, true, and beautiful contradicted or seemed to contradict revelation? Could one teach heresy as truth? The truth in the church is sometimes neither easy to understand or apply. An outside idea may seem to contradict the truth, but the difficulty might be our under misunderstanding of one or both. Even where God and God's church speak, the Christian educator must have humility about what he knows. If he's right about what the church says, he must still take care to apply it correctly in the particular situation. Finally, while the truth does not change, our fuller understanding of it as a community may. The creeds and councils refine our understanding and help us come to a more precise idea of a truth. Can this process continue? Fortunately, the church accepted this tension and continued to venerate the truths from Athens and worship the truth of Jerusalem. Triumphalism is misplaced, however. After all, the same history that shows that the church saved ancient wisdom and made possible the scientific revolution, also tells of times and places of anti-intellectualism and regression. The same church and educational system that preserves so much of pagan literature also at times limited the teaching of certain ideas. Beneficiaries of pagan techniques or ideas often use those tools or concepts while condemning their importance, seemingly forgetting their origin. By the time the Emperor Justinian closed the academy, the great texts, the best discussions, even on Plato, had already moved to the school of Constantinople. The closing of the academy still is an image of a problem. The saint should have left the intellectually dead to bury the dead. The very ability of the Eastern Roman Empire to endure for a millennium, to inspire the broken West to a renaissance, to form a commonwealth of nations, should cause us to wonder if the attention is not a source of educational energy. Tension is full of potential. The conflict between Athens and Jerusalem was, is for us, 
and will be for our successors hard. But educators always found a way. Educators strove to find virtue in Homer and wisdom in Plato. They worked to understand and apply the truths of theology. The effort is a dialectic. The end of this dialectic cannot be relativism, since the truth as truth is unchanging, but of a fuller understanding. St. Paul, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am also known. Revelation provides the hard reality, the perfect, against which all our speculations, all our speculations, even about revelation, must be judged. We think something is true, but we also, know, we also think something else is true. The contradiction is hard to resolve. Christian classical education is found in that tension. Tension tempts us to easily solve the problem, embracing a kind of intellectual monomania one way or the other. We have souls and bodies. This duality is difficult. This difficulty is difficult to live, especially at Lent. Have you noticed? Our bodies want one thing, our spirits want something else. Our bodies and our minds should work synergistically, but sometimes this harmony is broken. In philosophy, this dualism has fallen out of fashion. While the idea of body and soul has recent defenders, there is a materialist prejudice inside at least Anglo-American philosophy out of proportion to the evidence. A Christian educator can embrace the historic truths taught by the church that people have souls and bodies. Both soul and body count, giving us experiences in our minds and through our senses. This duality can create tensions in a broken world where what is is not always what it should be. Our body says one thing and our mind another, dissonance. The truth requires that we listen to both, refusing to erase either the body or the soul. Metaphysical materialism strives to reduce all ideas, all works of art, all human experience, the very quality of our feelings to the objects of physics. Our first experience, our own consciousness, is the seat of our experience of the material world. This consciousness seems nothing like the world we can measure. What is a unit of consciousness? The materialist metaphysics has a bad cultural track record showing an ability to sustain science, which is good, but not high culture like the concert we're about to hear tonight. Materialism hears organ music and tries to reduce the organist to the organ. Metaphysical idealism, on the other hand, sets, turns everything into a set of ideas, usually in a mind. This reduction of everything to ideas, a vast computer game, a simulation made real in God's mind, allows for high culture and science, but seems so implausible. While Samuel Johnson did not actually refute the idealist Bishop Barclay merely by kicking a rock, Johnson was noting that our initial impulse is that a rock is real in a very different way than mathematical objects, ideas, mind, or consciousness. Idealism hears organ music and stares at the organist, forgetting the organ. Instead, the material and the ideal, body and mind, harmonize, creating the music of the spheres, organ and divine organist. This holistic truth helped Christianity birth science and develop a diversity of cultures. I spent all my life wanting to visit Estonia ever since fifth grade and to see the beauty here. And what's wonderful about Estonia is it's not Houston. Um, what's wonderful about Houston is it's not Estonia if we're true to ourselves even if we come from the same orthodox perspective. The tension of not understanding fully sparks creativity. And so as educators, we must not hasten to a sterile monism, one or the other. More vitally is the need to teach all the truths, 
those that come from theology and those that originate in science. These often appear in conflict, sometimes for centuries. Some Greek thought, some Greeks suggested that women were not fully human, while Christian theology affirmed the full humanity of womankind. Christian education wobbled, but in the main refused a false consensus, an overly hasty harmonization with the spirit of the age. We taught the controversy, continuing to read Aristotle, who made women a little less than human, and Genesis, that proclaimed women's full humanity. Eventually, Genesis and the full humanity of all God's children, male and female, could be affirmed when we developed better philosophy. The easy answer is to either make one discipline or another the foundation and resolve all tensions by an appeal to this master guiding discipline. Such monomania in disciplines causes us to forget that theologians, I'm sorry if you're a theologian, theologians are human. Scientists are human. Artists are human. Human theologians can misunderstand revelation, misapply the creeds. Human scientists introduce their own bias, and so theorizing too often reflects the prejudices of the time. In the Victorian era, when scientists who came from colonial countries looked at the history of life, they saw the strong prevailing and nature red in tooth and claw. In our times, some of the same sorts of scientists will see cooperation and synergy. Amazingly, in both eras, what scientists see too often matches the politics that they profess. This is not to put down science. It is to say that everyone comes to us with a bias. Artists are also human. Human theologians can misunderstand revelation. Human scientists introduce their own bias. The arts can be corrupted by pandering to power and politics. Over the years, God, the cosmos, the community, will do peer review on our theological, scientific, and artistic interpretations and applications. Parents and our students in school, sometimes even those with power, will demand hasty harmonizations or easy answers that end debate, dialogue, and our wondering. If we stifle the controversy, killing the tension, creativity will die. Over time, the school and the church have produced answers and potential resolutions to problems. Old, irresolvable tensions give way naturally to new solutions, and they generate new tensions about which we can wonder. I guess when we get to heaven, we'll know. A rejection of reducing truth or the avenues of truth will lead to a classical Christian education embracing every form of truth finding. The very best ideas in any subject area will be examined in the search for truth and virtue. These will undoubtedly le lead to tension as communities of knowledge and culture disagree. The classical Christian school will tell the truth about the tension and refuse hasty resolutions, will go to the liturgy, work in the lab, and create art best we can, so help us God. Well, fortunately, we have a great defender of this tradition. Plato gave the ancient world the form of dialectic education in his writings, particularly his masterwork, Republic. And there's much to be said about Plato, but let's recall that in doing this, he did not and was not able to incarnate that education. This came only when Christians uh, began to do so. And how does this work? Kindergarten and college students, master received wisdom, they dialogue and wonder, they hypothesize and tell likely stories. Once we seem to be done with the search for wisdom, having settled all, we begin again. This process may seem to go in circles, as some critics suggest, and so it does. The circles, however, corkscrew up. The lover of wisdom ascends to better and more complete answers. So in younger grades, the image of the atom as nucleus and sun with electrons planets gives way to a better image in junior high school. 
and then to a simple version of quantum theory in high school physics. By college, the student might be introduced to something closer to the best contemporary theories of physics when he has the mathematics needed. I'm told by my friends in real physics that this process hasn't yet ended for physicists. We keep seeing more and more. A Christian can see this same growth in theology. We slowly gained a better and more consummate understanding of the Holy Trinity. After centuries, this was refined into a creed, but the questions then shifted to a higher and better things. Our wondering never ends, thank God. Yet this ideal comes with dangers for a Christian. We might forget Jerusalem in a love for Athens. This danger caused Tertullian to thunder that Athens had nothing to do with Jerusalem. Sadly, this only caused Tertullian to miss how much his thinking was dependent on Athens, and he ended up in a funny, heretical place. There's a need for a pastor to keep us from monomania, not Athens or Jerusalem, but Athens is a suburb of Jerusalem. This practical pastoral practicality came most clearly from the genius of St. Basil, Adopting any ideas from the Greeks and Romans who had been persecutors must have been difficult. But the saint overcame prejudice and did so. He was not swallowed up by Greek thought, as was a less balanced thinker like Origen. He did not cast out Greek thought like Tertullian. Obviously, there's a tension in reading the pagan Homer with his polytheism and truth. And so I'll end this section about embracing the tension with this quote from St. Basil. To be sure we shall become more intimately acquainted with these precepts of virtue in sacred writings, but it is incumbent upon us for the present to trace, as it were, the silhouette of virtue in the pagan authors. For those who carefully gather the useful from each book are wont, like mighty rivers, to gain ascensions on every hand. Instead of attention, St. Basil found wonder. The tension between two things we have good reasons to think might be true causes us to wonder. What is true? How might these two ideas harmonize? Is one false or are both false? This sense of wonder is wonderful and the sense of intellectual joy in anyone with a waking mind. We are driven from dogmatic slumber to look for the good God and the orthodox way. In his ethics, Aristotle suggested that virtue could be found in the mean between excess and defect in human action. Wonder is the point of virtue between cynicism and credulity when we face tensions in education. Cynicism is intellectual cowardice. If a man commits himself, then he sees, and often what he sees is error and a need to change. A cynic does not wonder about the truth. He commits himself to doubt always. Nothing can persuade the cynic to drop his mockery. He sneers at the committed materialist, showing his flaws. The theist with an argument gets only an eye roll in response. The cynic has seen through everything, so can see nothing. There's no wonder for the cynic. No science, only negation in the arts and culture. He can make fun of what others build. The posture seems reasonable because he's never duped, but he also never takes an intellectual risk. What great advancement in human achievement has ever been made by the cynic? Would this nation be free if there had only been cynics? The crabby and dry world of the cynic Defective in wonder encourages his opposite, the credulous man. The credulous man believes everything he wishes to believe and is kind. If you have a fringe idea, he may not listen, but will nod sympathetically. This credulous man misunderstands the words, the words of Jesus. The credulous man judges not, lest they be judged, as if Jesus meant that if one believed and trusted everything, nobody would ever condemn their own intellectual craziness. If you do not attack... If I do not attack your belief, your crazy belief that Atlantis exists, you must not condemn my theories about my UFO kidnapping. Science and sound theology are impossible to the credulous because both science and sound theology demand reasons and evidence. The credulous accepts all he can and refuses to disbelieve even that which he cannot loudly accept. 
The credulous seem nicer than the cynic until one is smashed by physical and metaphysical reality due to the mistakes the credulous have encouraged. The middle way, the orthodox way, is the path of wonder. We walk by faith, but faith is not contrary to reason, even if it includes the evidence of our hearts. We walk by faith, but faith is not contrary to emotion, even if it includes the evidence of the head. A person wonders and is skeptical about claims while being open to new truth. The person that is full of wonder, wonderful, is rarely sure, but is willing to take a stand. He will often have to change, adapt, concede, but every so often discover, ah, great joy, that he has found the truth. After all, the life of wonder would wonder even about the maxim, I can never find the truth. Wondering, in fact, has produced all the arts and science. The just live by faith. This is the orthodox classical Christian school. Faithful to what she believes so that not even a threat of death can make her lie about reality. Yet loving even our intellectual enemies. We know our failings, so our schools humble themselves to theological wisdom, scientific truths, and to the divine logos who governs the cosmos. This life of faith is not living against our reason or experience, rather living by best reason and our experience. In the context of a community where our arguments, passions, and explanations are open to criticism or affirmation comes the acquisition of a reasonable hope. Some few of us, great saints, may see so much that the experience becomes indubitable. For the rest of us, we walk by faith, not by sure sight in our substantial hope in God. We wonder because the gap between our knowledge and the possibilities of our error always exists. However, we also wonder because most answers lead to better questions. In science, when an idea is established in the community, gaining the force of a theory of science, science doesn't end. New questions spring from the theory, and science advances building on the theory, often leading to new theories. The dialectic too often is reduced to one idea supplanting another. If understood this way, the dialectic becomes the enemy of all education, especially classical education. Partisans of particular ideas will battle to supplant the others, and the result will be confusion in many students. Worse will be when one I ideology wins, often with the force of government and social sanctions, and forces a straitjacket, ending all wonder. This muzzling takes place in some religious and some secular schools where a pre-existing ideology is viewed as so triumphant that any criticism is so wrong-headed that criticism is no longer allowed. There is no respect shown to those who dissent from the consensus and true dialogue dies. The classical Christian school must not go this way. This is not because we are wobbly or unsure that we are classical Christian or orthodox. We do this because we are classical Christian and orthodox. The courage of our convictions allows us to examine all things, knowing the truth eventually will strengthen. Caution is in order. Students must be allowed to wonder about what they're considering, not what some skeptic online or about whatever issues the teacher is having. A truly dialectical class will not force false questions by prodding the student into asking what fits the script of the mentor or teacher. Every student is unique and has his own set of questions. The ideologue cannot be patient with the student, rushing them to the questions the ideologue thinks they should have. Well, what do we do with the student who's in a dogmatic slumber? Somebody's thinking, I can't get my students to think at all. We might prod such a student, asking what they think, what, why they think it, and the implications. We should not, however, try to force curiosity. Instead, we can do all we can through different types of activities to wake up the student. Nature often helps. I love this place. Our garden, trees, and at our home place, we have a natural playground. It's an urban campus. We're not blessed with beautiful nature like you have here. So we create it so our students have a place of wonder. All this, of course, for a Christian, culminates in a story that saves us, a story that helps us 
move from wonder to a vision of God. Much was anticipated long before the coming of the Christ by philosophers like Plato. He was a father of Athens, waiting in good providence for the Christ. He built a set of questions that only Christmas could answer. Plato did not, how to count, did not know how to count down the days of Christmas, but the incarnation still came. The word made flesh gave us the grace and truth we needed to educate without indoctrination or lies. Plato created classical education in his dialogue, Republic. In book seven, Plato introduces his cave analogy by saying, next, compare our nature in respect of education and its lack to such an experience as this. Picture men living in a sort of subterranean cavern. That Plato is speaking about education has been missed by most readers. That he's talking of our nature in respect to this education is discussed by even few commentators. Education or the lack of education impacts our very nature. We become what we are taught. When we do not, when we think we have escaped, too often this merely is the slavery of becoming the mirror image of what we once were taught. The education of the triumphalist ideologue will create prisoners in a cave. They are proud to parade their knowledge of what entertainment tells them is true. They will work hard to learn what the puppet masters wish them to learn. They are experts on shadows on walls. As a result, they are not free men and women. The nature of those educated by the tyrant becomes slavish, unfit for liberty. Why? The education of slaves does a long, slow, steady work in the mind and heart of the enslaved. The choice is freely made to accept one rather than the other. He is born free, the student, but becomes a slave. You cannot make a man without a slavish nature a slave. You can merely enslave him with power. And this is a loser's game. Schools with the slavish curriculum teach liberty is self-indulgence, freedom means starvation, and free work is done by someone else. Against this is the classical Christian Orthodox curriculum where liberty is being able to act virtuously. Freedom is doing duty voluntarily, and everyone, student and tutor, teaches. What would happen if everyone or nearly everyone taught? We mandate this at the college and St. Constantine School, and it makes all the difference. There are no administrators. Teachers make different decisions when they administrate than administrators who long ago were teachers. Schools exist for teaching and not fundamentally for administrating those who teach, but our salary structure and planning rarely reflect that. Plato ends Republic, as I will end, with a story about a man who comes back from the dead and teaches us that there is justice in God's cosmos. He says of this man and of the myth that he came back from the dead, and this story will save us if we believe it. And we shall safely cross the river of forgetfulness and keep our soul unspotted from the world. Classical education could only save us by hoping that a man would die, come back from the dead, and tell us that God is just. This resurrected man would assure us the beloved community would exist in the world to come, that justice would come over eternity. What Plato hoped for Jesus was. What Plato wrote, Paul preached on Mars Hill. So classical Christian education was born. And out of that, in God's good time, flowed the scientific revolution, the birth of the modern world. May this true story, the myth that happened in history, the word made flesh that dwelt among us, save us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Thank you very much uh, for um, uh, sharing this uh, um,
the thoughts about uh, classical Christian education with us and give us, given us an example of uh, St. Constantine School. Um, uh, so I'm sure there will be um, questions about uh, uh, this. So please uh, uh, raise your hands. Well, I can start. Thank you uh, very much for your presentation. I have uh, basically three points, two questions and one comment. Uh, the first one related to the connection between the name of the school and the symbol. So like this uh, genetically modified bird with two heads uh, actually was not used in the in right. time. So like it was used much later. So like what is, why, uh, why uh, did you decide to actually kind of combine that symbol and, and uh, Constantine's name as the name of the school. Uh, the second one rather goes more deeply into... Can I take a shot sure. at that question first? Or I'll, I'll totally lose track of it. Um, first of all, uh, we think very carefully about all the iconography of the school and including the name of the school. Uh, and so if you come to the school, uh, it's kind of like walking through you know, 2,000 years of uh, traditional symbology all conflated into one giant building. I, I think not unlike a cathedral, right? Cathedrals are built on many levels. Uh, a simple answer to why we picked the name St. Constantine to begin with is uh, that St. Constantine had an insight that I think was remarkable. You could be emperor of the Romans without Rome, which was no longer defensible. And that kind of insight we take for granted, it's the kind of insight that sort of business geniuses like Steve Jobs have. Once they think of it, everyone thinks of it. Uh, and then also, of course, uh, St. Constantine had the insight that Christianity could provide a unifying story that could save the empire. And then, of course, the symbology of the eagle with two heads, uh, we felt, wherever it came in time and history, uh, symbolized for us better than a single-headed eagle, though we love the school of St. John, and that, of course, is another symbol that's valid inside the church, of the dialectic, the tension that would take place for us. Because here's what we hope, my friend. If there was an age of empires when the sign of the cross could appear to one man and an empire be saved when he learned to think outside the box, so we thought that we could give the dialectic to everyone. And in God's grace, they could see the sign of the cross. And perhaps there could be a republic of Helens and Constantines. Not just one. So that's a little bit uh, about the symbology and how it ties together. I hope that's a little helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'll skip my third point. So just the second question. Uh, so it, you criticized, and I think uh, rightly so, the monistic approach yes. to the world, and especially like its uh, materialistic uh, manifestation, whatever that is in each uh, concrete case. Uh, it seems to me, and so the question is, am I hearing you correctly, that you would opt for some kind of dualistic uh, approach and that that dualistic approach could be understood along the lines of spirit matter or body spirit dualism. Uh, so first of all, is that correct? Uh, and if maybe yes, how would you distinguish that from Platonism? Because I think we would all agree that Platonism and Christianity, in spite of a long history of mutual dialogues, uh, cannot really be reconciled that easily. Surely, strong, strong versions of Platonism, maybe some versions of Neoplatonism, uh, when writers like J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis can be described as Platonist, Platonism is a very big category. But certainly strong versions of Platonism with transubstantiation, reincarnation of souls, uh, not compatible with Christianity. Uh, so here's what I would say to you. A, a dualistic approach may be closer than a materialistic or idealistic approach to the kind of language we would want to use as Christians. But the minute I adopted it, I would want to wonder about it and see what was wrong with it. And I wouldn't want to hasten to adopt it as a creed of the church because it isn't a creed of the church. 
So if we can't reduce everything to one thing, everything is material, though now the materialists are having a hard time telling us what matter is anyway, and we don't want to take the path of idealism and reduce everything to ideals, I also wouldn't want to adopt dualism as a straitjacket. I, I kind of like it at this point to explore it intellectually with my students because it's so unpopular that there are, few of them are likely to turn it into a dogma and so go into slumber about the topic. So the answer is, yeah, I think it's an interesting idea, but I don't see it as all Orthodox Christians should adopt it and we should turn it into the way that we should go. Does that make sense or do you want to follow up? All, all we need is a Reynolds ideology. That would be the worst. Uh, we need better thinkers than that in a school. Too many schools, by the way, come to adopt the ideas of their founders. And though I, I love our school and I love the school I see here, I hope one thing that I see here is the humility and humbleness of the leadership who are not making a school in their image. So it would be at the St. Constantine School. The very center of what I tried to say is that we live in the tension between our lack of certainty and, and the things that we believe to be true as Christians or as scientists or as artists. So down with dogma of that sort. Thank you. Are there more questions? If not, I, I, I would like to ask a question. Right. So I, uh, I, I thought it was uh, fascinating the way you uh, used the image of uh, Plato's cave as, uh, as a metaphor for modern education. I think there are so many different interpretations, so I, I quite uh, um, liked uh, your original approach to that. But I was also wondering about the practical implementation of your approach uh, at your school. Uh, so if, if um, if you want your students not to uh, be uh, subjects of a kind of uh, st uh, straitjacket ideological interpretations, so you would uh, allow them to question, not kind of skept be skepticists, but question and ask uh, um, you know, uh, 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 um, various uh, open questions about uh, let's say, um, I don't know, history of the church and maybe, you know, saints and what the Orthodox Church believes as uh, part of its tradition. So would you, how would you deal with this? How would you go about it's, it? It's a great question and in part I skipped. Uh, it's actually outlined for us by Plato, but better uh, by, I think, the fathers and by experience. Um, I want to suggest that the best way to produce a revival in some ways, is to tell everyone that they have to believe a religion is true. My friends who know more about it than I do say that um, theocracies like Iran cause a boom in atheism. It will perhaps shock no one that as the Chinese government has doubled down in anti-religious campaigns in the last decade, as far as we can tell, the result has been a religious revival. Um, I fear that if we're not careful in Christian education, what we will do is suppress natural questions with overly hasty answers and so create the opposite of what we intend. We will turn wonder into skepticism through our authoritarianism. So in the St. Constantine School, we will let a student ask any question and we accept any student. So we have students that range from students who come to us from China who are in fact atheists, uh, in the high school I'm talking about in particular, or the college. And we have students who are Orthodox Christians and we have students who are Baptists. We live in Texas, we have lots of students who are Baptists. Now they also know where the home team is coming from, what we believe. And we have lectures and context to ha you know, express what we believe. But in class, which is mainly dialectical at a certain point, question and answer, Socratic question and answer, like law school, a student can express any idea they wish as long as they're willing to do what? Defend it. But we also don't try to win arguments with ninth graders, which is a terrible habit a teacher can fall into. I mean, I debate 
uh, grown-ups uh, who are skeptics or atheists or materialists, I should not take joy in easily winning an argument with a ninth grader. So you let the ninth grader fully express what they have to say, provide them resources, have a discussion. Uh, this occurs often in Christian ethics in the United States. Uh, Christian ethical positions, particularly on sexual topics, have become quite controversial, and students will bring those things up. We let them bring them up. We express contrary ideas. We talk to them about what the church believes, and we dialogue about those beliefs. I can tell you this, the end result tends to be that kids in our context come to understand the teachings of the church and are more likely to accept them. If we shut down discussion, they have discussions on their own, not guided by thoughtful tutors, and I guarantee you this, they'll come up with whatever the spirit of our age is saying. Because they're just kids. We try to help students think for themselves and then pray with them. We have chapel every day that the Holy Spirit will illuminate their minds and bring them to faith. But after all, I can't make people see God. That's up to the work of the Holy Spirit. So I find dialogue works. Thank you very much. So if there are no <coughs> questions, so we thank uh, uh, John Mark and uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, make sure that this doesn't. There's several. No, 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 that's a different one. So. Okay.